Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and co-producer of these chats, along with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The Fireside Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. And today, I am sitting down to interview Fiona Horsley, who is a South Africa Boot Black 2017, and the only title holding Boot Black in South Africa. Isn't that right? That's correct. Okay. Let's begin right at the beginning a little bit. Tell me a little bit about your growing up, your family history, that kind of thing. Well, my family is very, very small. Um, I grew up in Johannesburg. Um, I've got an older sister growing up. I was very, 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 very quiet. I mean, you think I am quiet. Like, I think the last time you saw me, you have probably thought, geez, she's quiet. But uh, growing up, I was extremely quiet. I really kept myself maybe a little bit of a, a loner. I had a handful of friends, did what I had to do at school just to get by. Um, I was very much uh, into karate. I almost made a black belt. Um, then I moved on to horse riding and always doing something physical. And then I went on to music. Um, yeah, so I was basically keeping myself busy with interests like that. I am growing up with my karate belts. I used to tie them up and I used to climb trees using my, my karate belts. Um, so I was very much a tomboy. So I think I've always been drawn to more to the masculine side of things. So, um, yeah, that's basically how I was when I was younger. <laughs> my gosh, what took you to Cape Town? Well, um, my brother nor my sister, um, they decided to move to Cape Town because he got transferred. And I thought, you know, I don't want to be that family member that only goes to see family on special occasions, be it um Christmas or um Easter or whatever. I don't want to be that family member you only see every now and again. How did you discover yeah. that you liked the kinky community, the or however you self-define on that? Well it all started in 2012 where Yaku, the former chairman of SA Leather, um decided to hold the own like a Cape Town's version of Fawsome. And he knew of my um, rainbow goodies because I sell pride merchandise and um, he obviously knew of me and he and said well come come be part of the event so that was my eye opener to, like a introduction to the um, community as such because uh, at the time SA Leather was just come, a, a fresh and new because there was just um, it was before 2012 it was SA Leather men um, so he was trying to obviously do this event to introduce people, uh, you know, the broader community to leather and to kink. And um, so that was my introduction. I'd met a whole lot of leather men. I was like fascinated with their leather gear and their harnesses. And then I saw people getting pegs, you know, the pegging and um, with pegs on clothing pegs on all over. And I was, I observed um, some display of demonstrations. I thought that looks interesting because I went. Like, so I obviously investigated. I mean, I used Google because I didn't know if it laughed then. So I used Google. So I was curious. So I went and I went to look and see what it was all about. And I was like, I have to, I'm interested because it looks something like um, I want to explore. And that's how was my introduction to the leather and king community. How do you identify in the community? Meaning? Meaning, do you like boys or girls or are uh, No, I'm, I'm lesbian, I'm gay. Tell us a little bit about coming out in that respect. Okay. Um, well, I was very young. I was 16. I was still in high school. Um, I, I um, was infatuated with a couple of girls in high school. They were a couple of years um, ahead of me. And um, I realized, hang on, something's not right. I was fantasizing about being with women. And then by the time I got to 18, I was like having full on, um, full on fantasies about being sexually with women and not with boys. I'm going, oh my goodness, what's going on? I can't be like this. No, 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 no. I, I, I didn't want to be like that because at the time, um, being gay in South Africa wasn't exactly um, accepted. I mean, gay marriage wasn't around then. So I didn't want to be that. So I denied myself. I said, no, I can't. I'm, mm -mm, no, no, no. 
I can't be gay. Because I knew, and there was another fellow classmate, she was in my class, and um, the girls in the class used to bully her and tease her, the fact that she, they knew that she was like, she liked another girl. So I thought, I can't, I can't go through that bullying, that torment, but at the same time, I want deep down inside, I wanted to actually say to them, um, say to her, I'm on your side. I'm, you know, we can stick together. I'll support you. But I couldn't because out of fear. So at 22, only then did I come to out to my family. Um, so, but uh, in terms of coming out to my family, in terms of being into leather and exploring kink, um, I think it was um, because I was so open with mom, my mom anyway, I spoke to her about anything. So I wasn't scared to actually say to her, mom, um, I've, I've got to tell you something. You know, that whole like fear of like, oh, I can't actually verbalize but we, what you want to say. I, I just spoke about it. And it wasn't a matter of coming out. I just spoke about it. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Tell us a little bit about your first experiences with leather kink. Well, my first experience was at a social event. It was a demonstration at a um, local member's um, house. Um, and there was a couple that came was came up from overseas, obviously friends of um, fellow members of the Leather, and they proceeded to have a, demonstra- a live demonstration where the, there was a lady and a guy, and she basically pegged him. And also there was also... Um, Another one was flogging, and I was like, "What?" I observed it, and you know, that was my well, basically, attending demos because at that time I wasn't, I didn't know about fit life, so I didn't get to go to play parties or anything like that. Okay, how did it evolve for you? Well, see, um, I got a part, um, more members came into SLA that, that also were part of fit life, the community on fit life, and um, said. There's a couple of play parties come along. I realize I'm a big boyer. <laughs> it's like, being a boyerism for me is a huge turn. And it's like, it gets everything going for me. I, I love being a boyer. Um, and I observe people getting back, getting wax play. I've observed needle play. I've observed flogging. I observed um, a, guy, a rope at the same time, all at a play party. And um, I am very, very shy, as you probably know, Doug. <laughs> I'm very, very shy, and um, I also I'm not very confident as well. I realized that I need to get, do something about my confidence, and particularly body confidence. So I was tempted to do the do the needles. I was I was curious about doing the wax and doing the needles, and I thought maybe it's a bit much to do both in one evening. <laughs> but um, I just I don't know what it is about myself that I am to this day. I don't have the body confidence to just or the confidence to just explore myself even though i've been into many dungeons being a voyeur and watching people and going that looks you know being interested but to actually physically do it i'm finding a big challenge there i do remember when visiting cape town that the scene was very small uh i did find though that a couple of the bars there i recall a bar called amsterdam is that right that's right yeah yeah, and I recall at least there was some social outlet, but not a lot. There was. There was. I understand was there for the leather and king community, but the big, big but <laughs> is that it was strictly for um, men only. Oh. So if you were gender non-conforming, non-binary, trans, a, a woman, you weren't allowed in. And that was a big... A big issue. Since then, I think it's closed down. So, unfortunately, that's no longer. Tell us how you began to explore boot blacking. Well, that started um, around about 2015, December 2015, our first contest where we had our first Miss Essay Leather, um, and a whole bunch of um, some title holders from the US and Canada came over and um, it was toward the end of the contest, the last, the Sunday of, of the, the contest. And I noticed there was on the far end of the swimming pool, there was Patty and Ra- uh, Ramian and Yaku all talking in a little corner. I was like very curious now, what is going on here? You know, um, then they called me over and I noticed in Patty's hands, there was a boot black stand 
and and basically they were talking to me about how they wanted to actually raffle it off, but they didn't want to do that because the chances are it's going to land up in somebody's in somebody's uh, closet and not going to be used. It's probably going to just sit somewhere back in the, somebody's cupboard. And they wanted to give somebody that they felt would actually do something with it. And funny enough, June, July 2014, where uh, Leslie came over to South Africa um, to, do, to do shark cage diving, and she was very kind enough to do a boot black workshop. And that's when I, I felt like, I don't know if you've experienced where everything's just stands still and you, know, you just transfix on one person from what, whatever they're saying, their hand movement, their body language, everything. I was watching Leslie like that. I was like, totally spellbound. And now I said to Yaku that evening, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be your first boot black that evening. So fast forward to that contest on weekend. Patty's standing there with her arm around my shoulder saying these amazing things. To this day, I can't remember a word. Oh my God. <laughs> I actually often think back to that, that day. And I actually can't remember what Patty said to me, but I knew at the time it was just like, a light bulbs are going off. The world was standing still again. It's like this is it. This is what I my my. Your calling. My calling, yeah, you know, into the leather community, my part where I, you know could be, and um, so they gave me this kit. It had some polish, a brush, some cloths, and um, then the, Patty put me in contact with Dara and uh, Dara Bryant, and um, that. February, I think it was, yeah, February. Um, we had our first be black um, Skype Skype chat, and that the rest is history, basically. So that's my introduction to be black. I, I'm very fortunate. Leslie Anderson is family to me, yeah, and uh, I have seen her touch so many people, and bring so many people into the boot blacking uh, part of the community. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's really, it's really, really special. And um, I've been wanting to come back to the US and actually spend time with Leslie. I know the last time I was at IMSL, it was 2019. And I've never, I got to speak with Leslie briefly a couple of times, but not actually sit down and mm -hmm. um, talk again. So I would love to get back to, back to Chicago um, and actually spend some time with her. Tell us a little bit about how you began boot blacking on your own? On my own. Um, well, as I was having these Skype chats with Dara and she was they were teaching me, you know, uh, teaching me things as I go along. Um, I basically got um, a hold of some really old South African army boots and using what Dara was teaching me and using applying it to those boots so that as, as I went along, I was I was um, practicing or learning on South Africa boots, and then after when I got confident, then um, I said to Yaku, I want to do a workshop, and I did my first public boot blacking at a workshop for the SAA leather community. That, yeah, that was about um, six months after my first um, Skype chat with Dara. Now, most boot blacks I know are very partial to specific products. Yes. Do you have specific products that you insist on using? Well, the thing is, in South Africa, we only basically have um, two, maybe three brands to choose from. Um, it's uh, Kiwi, and uh, we've got a brand called Nugget, the Lion. Uh, I don't even remember in South Africa they had Lion um, uh, matches and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but they now now actually make a, now they actually make shoe polish, and then there's another brand that I found on Instagram called uh, Rhino. Um, but um, they're very much very high in petroleum base. I don't know if you smell boot, um, polish, where it's got a very high petroleum, uh, almost like a um, petroleum gas smelt in them, like petrol gas smelt in. Oh. Um, which I know is not exactly the best thing to have in a, in a polish. Um, but I was actually very much at the beginning, um, a whole bunch of boot blacks put together a kit for me and sent me a, a whole lot of Angelus 
and um, and then I got my hands off of some Lincoln, and I fell in love with Angelus and Lincoln. Um, so I don't really even look at South African brands anymore. <laughs> I really like um, Angelus and Lincoln. So I, when I do boot black, I ask, obviously ask the person who I'm uh, sitting for or, or sitting sitting for me, sorry, um, which brand they prefer between Lincoln and uh, Angelus. But I really like Angelus. Now I remember when I was there seeing your tech boot. Yes. And I remember being very impressed with that. Is that from the boots that you mentioned a few moments ago? No, that's a completely different pair of boots. Um, it's, um, I got, they were actually brown South African army boots and I dyed them. Um, our, my tech boot was completely different to what you experienced at Imsor. Um, I had um, a week to actually work on them, whereas Imsor had half an hour. <laughs> so I, I turned them from black and um, brown to black and obviously tried to get them the best shine and get rid of all the nicks and scrap and scratches and stuff as best, best as I could in that week. Now, how do you see your evolution from your first attempts at boot blacking to where you could do such quality work? How did that evolve? Well, it's a matter of confidence, I think. It's a matter, matter of confidence in what I've been taught and actually applying it and actually in confidence in, in, in it. Um, I think it's the confidence factor. At the beginning, I was very unsure. What am I doing right? Um, I wanted to make a good impression on Dara. I wanted to make sure that I'm doing things correctly. But I think Dara's got a, a very unique way of teaching that made me feel confident in myself and, and got a lot of reassurance and a lot of, you can do this. Um, and at the end, by the time I got to the contest, I was very confident in what my skill set was and actually applying it. For the international audience who may not know, would you please explain who Dara is? Dara Bryant is the International Miss Boot Black 2014. Um, Dara has um, been very much, quite a lot involved in the Enzol International Miss Boot Black contest for a few years now. Um, yeah, so Dara is a very much a title holder and she goes beyond, they go behind being a title holder in terms of teaching and be involved in the community in, in terms of Imzol, Baba, so, yeah. Do you still, for example, Skype with people or, or get on Zoom like this in order yeah. to keep improving your skills? Well, um, I've done a few uh, Skype chats with fellow my fellow um, siblings from my title year. And we often have Skype chats where we um, be black and together online and show what we've done and they show what show what I, they've done and we like compare and swap note, you know, like what did you do there and how did you do that? And so we've actually when I was last in the US, um I went to I was in Seattle for a while with um Bo Black, who's um one of my siblings. And we spent I think a good week, a good five or seven days straight where we sat until three o'clock in the morning boot blacking and I was learning things from Bo and Bo was like, oh, how do you do that? So it was, it's, that's what I, I've done. I've, that's why one of my, my purposes of actually when coming back that year was to actually speak to as many boot blacks as I possibly can and boot black as much as I can so that I can actually um, maintain my, my skill level as well as learn something new. Now, how has the community in South Africa received you as far as your work? Well, at the, well as I, at the beginning, um, my workshops were well attended. Um, um, when we have ha did have, have events, uh, I did I take the opportunity to be black at them. So every time I, I, we had an event, I had the chance to be black. Um, I have offered to um, them to say, if you have a vest or a pair of pants or boots or whatever, you know, with to contact me. So I, I have kept that uh, channel of communication open in terms of saying I'm here to boot black. That's wonderful to hear. Um, I notice in Europe, sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect. So. I think some people are a little bit like, this is Malia, they do I trust you? I don't know. <laughs> um, but I try to tell them or reassure them, look, I know what I'm doing. Um, you can watch me do it if you like right now in front of you. If you don't want me to take it home with me, 
Um, so yeah, I try to keep as honest and open communication um, with the people that I well, was in contact with at the time. But it must be a little bit difficult for you being the sole proprietor uh, without a lot of um, boot black community support. Yeah, the, it is because like I say, I'm the first. So it's my, it's my responsibility to teach somebody to how to be black and um, get them involved and then get the, and third person involved and ha- developing a chain of people to actually have a community in South Africa because at the moment, it's not a culture in South Africa to be, uh, go and have your um, boots to be a shoe shard. It's not like at the airports in America. Mm-hmm. Literally every airport I went to, there was like a few boot blacks doing or shoe shiners doing their thing. Where in South Africa, there's no culture of boot blacking or shoe shining. Um, so it is very difficult to actually try and educate people to let them know what it is in terms of, yes, the shoe shining make things look pretty and shiny and stuff. But there's also the leather and the kinky side to it as well. So to try and educate people in, to know what it is and for them to actually go, oh, okay, maybe I should actually, you know, you know get involved. It's very difficult. I found, it, I found it very, very difficult, especially when our community here is very, very small. Mm, yeah. um, and I actually said to Una, who is uh, the second Miss SA Leather, um, I said to her, maybe we should contact the organizers of the play parties and actually say can I have my stand there to actually try and catch somebody's eye you know do, do you think that it, it may pick up at some point I hope yeah I've tried so hard Doug it's, it's been it's like am, am I wasting my time <laughs> kind of feeling um but I feel so passionate about it because it felt like family it felt community which I wanted and needed I felt at home I had Fellow leather people around back talk about certain things, and um, you know, and then it's not there anymore. So it's it's very frustrating when nobody there's no communication, and that's what I find extremely frustrating. The the circumstances here in North America are so different from that. Well, I find it so open and well, op- more open and more ma- more there. You, you you've got like in Seattle, you've got the cuff and it's right there. It's not some corner bar, some hiding somewhere. It's mm-hmm. it's there. The community is there. Where it's, it's very much underground. And I think maybe I was actually thinking about it before we started this um, this chat. Um, is that I think people in South Africa a lot of are afraid to actually let other people know that they are into BDSM or kink or some sort of fetish because they might affect their work life or their their family members don't know and then they find out and then they've got to deal with that. So I think lots of people keep it quiet and keep it, you know, not seen. And, I, I, and it makes me sad because um, I d- it's like how do you actually attract people when they're scared? You know, it's, it's, yeah. Yes, yes. How do you feel things may open up again after uh, COVID restrictions end? Or do you? I, th- I think the play parties will also te- you know, start up again. Um, and I think I think lots of people will still be nervous, but I think there will be some people that will, once everybody's vaccinated, um, things will pick up again. I think... How attended are these play parties? Is there a good crowd? Um, the last time, the last one I went to, there must be at least 30, 40 people. Oh, Okay. Yeah, there must have been, there was a lot of people. There was, yeah, I'm all right. There was about 30 or 40 people in, in, spread out, out throughout this house. I mean, they converted their garage into a playroom. They converted their um, bra area into a playroom. The swimming pool was open, so you could, you know, it was just in somebody's house, and it was great because it was like 40 people. Um, the house was full of people. It was like a social area, people doing rope, and it was it was fun. The other one is also attracts at least at least thirty people at a time. I think they're also restricted so that everybody's not on top of each other, so they've got space. Um, so yeah, that, I think it averages around by thirty to forty people at a time. So for the international audience, would you please explain a braai? Although I know it, <laughs> other people... a braai a, a bra is basically a barbecue. So it's the Afrikaans word for for braai is. Um, 
for barbecue is braai. Okay. Yeah, I think some people would not know this. Well, the full word is braai place, which is, you know, but it's, um, everybody shortens it to braai. Generally, boot blacking is a skill that's mentored, that it, that is uh, taught generation to generation in, in the right. community. How are you doing that? Well, um, I started teaching, I think, yeah, it, it, somehow it fizzled out, unfortunately. I, I would think it would be completely sad if the South African uh, boot blacking stopped with you. Yeah, no, that's, well, that's the sad part because I've, I've spent two years of Skype chats with Dara Bryant. <laughs> Yeah. And I learned so much from Dara, and I'm totally grateful to Dara. I, I really am. And I really don't want my skill level to drop um, either. And I would love for things to, to bloom again because it, boot blacking is a, such a nice way, a different way to connect with somebody when they sit for you. Um, so it's, um, I would be very upset if, it, well, if things just you know, stopped. As a boot black, What's been your greatest challenge? Oh, challenge is finding the right products. Because before I was with the noted with, um, with, 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 with stuff uh, to find the right, the right length. Shoelace, boot laces was an issue. Hmm. Um, the simple thing is boot laces. I mean, really, um, the finding different color polishes is a, is a mission in South Africa. Um, I mean, you get tan, brown, and black. I mean, in the U.S., you've got oxblood and cordovan and, and blue and red. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's not fair. <laughs> I mean, you've got access to different dyes, different color dyes, different equipment. And South Africa is trying to find, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It's just, hmm. it, that was my biggest frustration at the beginning. And thank goodness, like I said at the beginning of the chat, for other people blacks that donated to me. Because if I didn't have those tools, I don't know how I would have actually been able to have the content enough to actually say, I'm going to go and compete for International Miss Boot Black um, mm -hmm. when I don't have the tools. I mean, the right tools and the right, you know, um, polishes and brushes and trying to, even a brush, it's just, it was trying to find the right brushes because in South Africa, the stuff that you find in markets is basically um, not horsehair brushes, but these horrible um um, almost like plasticky kind of brass bristles that will obviously not be suited to, to boot blacking. Um, it, it's not freely available. Um, mm -hmm. it's, that was my, one of my, my first biggest frustrations. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Um, hopefully living in the US, <laughs> to be honest. Um, um, like I'm quite, we've still got, after four years of since we competed, our sibling group is still very much connected. I still, um, last time I was in the US, I spent six weeks in the US and I went from Seattle to Portland to Los Angeles to Colorado Leatherfest and be able to be black there and make so many connections with other people. And um, so uh, me and Bo in particular are very, very close and both just moved to New Orleans and I want to try and follow and go go and move in to immigrate. Um, I don't know how long, it's probably going to take a while um, to get there. Um, but I, I want to see myself in the US um, with the community that I miss and um, living a new life, basically. <laughs> From my perspective, I, I think that you're yeah. sort of a salmon trying to go upstream with being sort of a sole proprietor in South Africa. Right. I think uh, that how do you keep from burning out with that situation? <laughs> I just persevere. <laughs> I just, you know, like, okay, not working and not to try and get myself worked up or angry or upset. I just step back for a while and then I pick up again. Uh, it's, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to, I'm very really much a fighter in, t in terms of something that I believe in, I want to be a part of and feel passionate about, I will pursue it continuously. So it's not, I, don't, I won't back down. 
I know I work at that now. I'm going to pursue and um, try and make it work and um, try and get my confidence up to get out there and do something, uh, not be so shy about myself and um, and actually just go ahead and, and make it happen. That's amazing, truly. You know, Fiona, I, I absolutely hope that your efforts in South Africa are going to bring more uh, community forward. Uh, the South African community was so beautiful when I had the chance to visit. I hope we will see that uh, begin to come back after the COVID restrictions. I hope so too, Doug. I really do. Yeah. So, well, Fiona, thank you very much for participating in Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. Pleasure seeing you again. <laughs>